So everybody should be see that little recording thing. Who is that? That's Minal. Minal, you want to introduce yourself? Norris is wondering who you are. Oh, hi, Norris. I'm Minal. Um, I um am a second year beekeeper now. Um, Nancy Tasker is mentoring me. Um, I am. We are in the Philly Beekeepers Guild, but I now live in Eagleville, which is where my hives are. Check. Great. So, Alicia, when at at some point our cleaning crew do show up, and we've taken all the trash over there to help them out. Um, okay. So, um, anybody else uh, on the uh, on the Zoom want to say hi or introduce themselves? Do we have any beginning beekeepers uh, with us tonight? Um, hi, I'm Joy Berge. I've uh, had mason bees on and off over the years. I've had a couple of bad seasons with mason bees. I was ready to give up, but my friend Leslie Cheeseman, who I think is a member of this group, invited me on. So I'm Great. here for some inspiration. So you're you're like a native beekeeper. Yeah. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. That's I'm cool. not not interested in the honeybees, um, interested in the other ones. That's and cool. I've known Mino for many years. So Mino, it's nice to be connected in this capacity. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Hear, hear that, Jason? Your message is getting out. Um, uh, so I have a few announcements to make. Uh, does anybody have anything else they uh, want to say or ask before I do that? Okay. I have something to share. Hey, Joe. Go hey. ahead. Oh, hey, Joe. Hey. Hey, I'm, um, hi, everyone. I'm a relatively uh, new beekeeper, Mark Berman. Um, in, uh, gave me a little info last season. We were together at Bartram's Gardens. Um, so I'm just starting and uh, enjoying it. And wanted to share that um, I'm a member of the uh, ESP, Entomological Society of Pennsylvania. Um, we had our meeting two days ago and would like to maybe um, connect with the Bee Guild. They uh, shared um, some videos that they put together on bees and wasps. Oh, cool. And I was thinking as the Bee Guild has events, maybe I could come with uh, some um, entomological society uh, stuff and just, you know, share part of the table and kind of like co-promote these groups. I think people from the um, Entomological Society of Pennsylvania would happily join the Bee Guild. And I think together combining forces might you know, uh, just expand a little bit in a nice way. So um, I'll drop the video in the chat. Um, I was just talking with the president um, on the board and uh, they were just excited to connect in whatever way we can. So if you guys are open to it as events come up, maybe I can, you know, jump in with some ESP stuff. That's that would be great. We're all about uh, community and making connections. So yeah, we uh, and we do like other bugs, you know, we're, we're not just uh, be bigots. We like all the bugs. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay, great. I'll put it. I'll put the uh, talks in the chat and just uh, you know take it from there. Excellent. Great. Joe, did you get bees? No, but um, if you get swarms coming up this spring, I'll take them. So, maybe, yeah, visit me at my new site, and we'll and and we'll uh, maybe get a split off of me or something. Okay, great. I'll I'll text you. All right. I just wanted to pop on and say hi. I'm Jesse. Um, I think my name shows up as Justin. He's he's the beekeeper. I'm the bee buddy. But I am uh, excited about tonight's program. I see tons and tons of native bees in my yard because I have tons and tons of native plants. So um, I highly encourage everybody who is fascinated by insects in general. Um, to plant lots of native plants, you will just see the most amazing diversity of insects once you do. Yeah. Love it. Yeah, and what we were what we said in our class last week was the the, the native bees are the ones who need saving. Uh, and uh, you know, by extension, all of the native bugs are the ones that need saving. The 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 we've got a bug pop bug pockles going on here. 
So uh, yeah, I think I'm I'm really excited about Jason's um, thing and Joe. I think that um, I think yeah, let's let's get together, let's talk about it, and um, and try to uh, figure out ways to save the bugs. We can have a new a new slogan for everybody. Anybody else want to uh, chime in here? All right. It's lonely down here at St. James. I know it's raining, but it's not that far from anybody. Anyway, um, so uh, let me say a few things. So we started our beginners class last week. Um, the class is structured differently this year. If anybody uh, doesn't know, we are going. We did the first lecture class on Saturday. We're only going to do one. And um, in the past, we've always done two lecture classes. And um, you know, if we were lucky, a uh, a uh, you know an apiary day. So this this time, and then we also had this mentorship program where we we, we would give you twelve. Little, uh, um, this time, what we're doing is, uh, you're not talking. Can you mute? I wonder why I'm not showing up here. Do you, do you guys see me? Because I see the Hat Trick Honey logo. Do you guys see me? <clears throat> we can see you, but uh, can't hear you too clearly. Uh, I'll move up a little. Yeah, I'm looking at like kind of a Brady Bunch configuration of of uh, people's faces. You guys are in my top left square. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna show myself here for a second. Um, that, that's better audio. There you go. Good. I like the haircut. Thank you. I did it myself. <laughs> um, so, yes. so so the class has started. But if you, if anybody uh, feels like joining the class, um, it it's still. I'm to mute everybody. All right. Let me just. Oh, it's twenty-four. Here. That's great. Ah, come on, you guys. They're at they're at the St. James School. All right. So, you can still hear me? Okay, good. Um, so instead of so the way we're going to do it this year is we're going to have six more um, evening lecture classes, and then. After each lecture class, we will have a day in the apiary. And um, the classes are all uh, designed to happen sort of at key um, uh, times during the beekeeping season. And um, the idea this year is not to get you started with bees, it's to let you see what the whole year of beekeeping is like. And at the end of that, if you want to be a beekeeper, um, we will uh, happily engage with you and um, help you do it. Um, if you don't want to be big, a beekeeper, that's great too. Um, we'll get you connected with Jesse and the others to uh, learn how to plant native plants and with uh, Jason to how to how to take care of mason uh, native bees. Um, but uh, but but that's the way we want to teach the class this year. And um, we have we're doing an experiment with our uh, with a sort of the second year people that went through uh, on the uh, on the uh, mentorship program this year. They're going to be helping with the with the apiary section sessions. And if that works out well, um, we will roll out a, a sort of a, a structured um, intermediate class for the people who are taking the class this year. And there may be some bees involved in that. We we may be able to help you get some bees. Um, we have we're, we're doing a lot of sort of new stuff this year and we are um, trying to get the word out there's a lot of opportunities um, to participate and to um, help us out um, we are doing a lot of events um, so we're going to be showing up at different uh, different people's get-togethers and selling honey um, if anybody has honey that they want uh, to sell and they are a member, um, we are interested in talking to you. Um, even if it's uh, crystallized, we have I've set up a, a warming cabinet to uh, 
liquefy the uh, crystallized honey, even if it's in a jar. So um, if you have honey and you would like to, to sell it, we um, have a number of events coming up um, and some of them have, have been fairly uh, big in terms of sales in the past. So we expect that, uh, that we could, we, we expect that we'll move a fair amount of honey this spring before harvest. Um, we're also looking for uh, beekeepers. We, we have a number of, uh, of apiaries um, we're, that we're going to be managing. And um, we'd like to have, uh, uh, we'd like to hire uh, people to, to uh, take care of them. Um, the, uh, the jobs are paid jobs um, and uh, you'll be paid a, 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 you'll be paid a certain, a, kind of a fixed amount for the whole season. And uh, the, you'll, we'll ask you to, uh, you know, work with us and follow our directions. Um, essentially we want, to make sure that the bees don't swarm, that they're healthy and they survive the winter. Those are our goals. Um, and as long as you uh, can get in, get, uh, get behind that, um, we wanna talk to you. Um, we're looking for people with a little bit more experience, uh, a couple of years of, uh, under their belt. Good, we want to, we'll ask you about your winter survival rate and uh, your experience of swarming, um, but, uh, we're uh, looking for people to help us keep bees uh, for a change. Um, there's a few, there's, I, I think there's something else, but I think those are the big ones right now. We're also, uh, we've, we're, those are the big ones. I'm gonna be sending out an email about this soon. Um, there's a few other uh, items on the list um, for different uh, people with different uh, goals. Um, what time is it? Where are we at time-wise? 7.15, so we still got, it. Um, does anybody have any um, questions about their bees right now? They're pretty, we've had really warm weather around here. Um, I, I moved um, all my bees uh, the, in the, over the last two days from one, uh, one field to another one. Um, and um, they're amazingly uh, healthy uh, as from what I can tell, or at least there's a lot of bees and they were very unhappy with me moving them. Um, does anybody have any questions about their bees right now or, or um, want to talk about uh, um, keeping bees before we launch into our native bee uh, presentation? Any questions? I've muted everybody, so you'll have to unmute yourself to ask a question. Dave, I just have a comment. This is Priscilla. Um, you mentioned you had to move your bees because of they're getting in a pool, somebody's pool. And I forgot to tell you, but um, another beekeeper mentioned the same thing happened to him. And he took peppermint oil and put it on the edge of the pool. And that kept the bees from going in the pool. That's a great uh, tip. I think my, and, and I had to move them for that reason last summer. And um, there I had about, I had upwards of 20 hives next to this pool. And I don't think anything would have kept them out of it um, other than, uh, you know, a, a, a dome or something. Um, but uh, so, so it was, uh, yeah, I had to move those out and I put them in a field. I put them in this field and I was told, hey, uh, you know, Sometimes they put cows in that field, but um, not for the next couple of years. And then of course, as soon as I put them there, the cows came in. And um, I don't know if, I mean, cows and bees are uh, not natural enemies, um, but um, the uh, cows like to um, scratch themselves on stuff. And, and if, if they scratch themselves too vigorously on your beehive, over the hive goes, and, um, and amazingly, uh, I found one hive uh, knocked over like three weeks ago, and I looked inside, and I, I couldn't see anything in there, and I just set it back up. I didn't even put it on a bottom board, and as I was moving them, I, my, I was telling my friend who was helping me, ah, those guys are dead. They were, they were killed by the cows, and he said, you better look, and of course, I opened the top, and there was a whole bunch of bees in, there, <laughs> in their cluster and um, wondering what I was doing, uh, opening the top. 
uh, since the bottom was already open. So um, I can't, I was going to shoot all the cows, but now I can't shoot all the cows. Um, so uh, um, that's good, I guess. <laughs> um, any, any other, any other uh, interesting stories or, or fascinating questions? I was curious when everybody's starting point this year is going to be for adding their supers. I was going to go by the bloom of the pussy willow, the native pussy willow, which gives really good protein content, 45% compared to 15 dandelion protein. Mm -hmm. But with the maples going pretty early, I'm not sure now what my reference is going to be. What, what's everybody else going to use as their indicator when to start adding their supers? I don't have an answer. Does anybody have an answer? You want to do calculations based on degree days? In April. Nora says April. Any other uh, any other ideas, Jason? What's your what do you? Think? So I guess my rule of thumb is I wait until I get about a week straight of fifty degree weather without it dropping to thirty at night. So that's kind of how I usually do. Um, and uh, I try not to even open my hives because if I open my hives, and it's beautiful seventy five you know seventy degrees during the day here in California, but at night. Um, it could drop down to 30 and then that cold air is going to come in and kill my brood. So um, because I've broken their weather stripping. So um, that's that's just my rule of thumb. But yeah, ask five beekeepers, you can get 10 answers. So there you go. Does anybody else have like a, a, a looking for a signal from the environment the way Jason is? I think in the Jason past, a lot of people talk about when the dandelions start blooming. Mm -hmm. But that can be so sporadic. You just see one here and there. And then it almost seems like once you really start noticing them, that's almost too late, you know, to try to stave off the, the brood nest backfilling. Um, oh, one tip I did hear, hear recently was, I think Michael Bush uses this technique. He closes off his normal entrance and then provides an offset super or an upper hole as an entrance to help minimize brood nest backfilling. I might experiment with that a little bit this yeah. year because that's always, I think the bane of most of us when we're trying to do swarm prevention is that darn back nest just fills up faster than the supers above it and eliminating the lower entrance might be might be key. It could be, yeah. I think, I, I mean, I I plan to just be watch closely and, and you know, when the... Uh, when I see that the when I see a good strong brood nest, I'm going to try. I'm going to experiment with single brood chamber this year. Um, so I'll probably go early um, and put a put a single, you know, a, a super directly on the brood nest, um, and then uh, take you know put in the queen excluder once there's some uh, a little bit of brood up there. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't have a signal. I saw a, a, a dandelion, you know, with in seed today. So I, I, <laughs> I don't know. You can't rely on anything anymore. Yeah, the maples are starting to, to bud out. I, the, the bees that I was moving were, uh, you know, bringing in lots of pollen um, or dust. I mean, they were also like the, the other thing that was happening with mine where they were, uh, they were gathering the a uh, pig feed um, that apparently baby pigs, you feed them a kind of a powdered food and uh, the bees were uh, picking that up and bringing it back to the nest. Um, so yeah, it's a, I, I don't know, Jace, uh, Justin, I think it's a, I, I, it would be interesting to kind of compare notes and try to, and try to, I mean, I, I think you're probably more, um, advanced and and a lot a lot of us in terms of what you're watching for and your awareness of the the flowers so i i think that's a great uh tip i don't know where i would find a pussy willow in mount airy though by any stream probably near streams jesse says yeah but they are like they are superior protein content so if anybody wants a good early pollen protein source for for bees and all pollinators Native pussy willow is a great one, and uh, they're so pretty. You know how fuzzy they are and how, how tall they can get. So it's a shrub slash tree. What is it classified as, Jesse? A shrub, uh, like a big sheet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Popped out at twelve fifteen feet. Grows very well off of cuttings too. So if you know someone with one, they can easily um, share it. 
Cool. Jason, don't you have manzanita flowering right now or it's already done? And, yeah, this the, is a California question. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, we are seeing them starting to bud and, and, and go to flower now. Um, and we're getting a lot of um, cherry trees too here starting to bloom, cherry blossoms coming out. So that's usually the signal we look for in this area. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I guess with the winter, with the cold snaps, I'm just being a little extra careful and a little bit extra lazy because this way I could just go out. I could feel the weight on my hive. If it seems like they got enough to get them through for another month or so, I'm just really leaving them a bay. If they're, you know, feeling super light, then, you know, I may add, you know, add, a, add a couple of frames of honey on it, but I try not to open the brood box until I got that warm weather for a couple of weeks straight. Jason, you're a real believer in the uh, propolis seal, right? Yeah, that's their tool, I think, to, you know, to keep it closed and they keep the hive inside at about 95 degrees. Um, and, you know, if it drops below about 50, that's enough to kill the brood. So um, that's my kind of, at least just, you know, the research I've done on it, that's kind of what it's leaning towards. But really, you know, uh, every situation is going to be different. For sure. Anybody else have any B questions or, or stories or comments? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, second year beekeeper, two hives. Yesterday, I'm in Lancaster County. Um, you know, we had a pretty warm day and I'm not at home. My wife came home about 1.32 and she said there were 20 large flying insects. Mm. Um, and by the time she went back to look at what they were, they were gone. But um, I, the only thing I came up with was maybe there were drones, but that doesn't seem plausible. Um, hmm. Go ahead, Jason. Um, sorry, this was at night? No, in the middle of the day. A peak oh, okay. flying. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to mention if, if it were if it were at night, you know, then and you see bees flying around your lights at night. Uh, we are worried about the zombie fly, um, a parasite that, you know, is sending, sending bees out to light, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, and I definitely have seen that. We have a kitchen uh, window light and I've had bees banging into that, mm -hmm. um, but that was last summer. Yeah, this was during the day. So um, I don't know if it'll happen again or um, what they were, but um, I, just... I got a tool for you. Yeah, I'll share it during my presentation. There's a tool that okay. you can use, you know, and, and you can share it with with your wife or, you know, anyone. Basically, you take a picture of an insect and it'll identify it for you. So I already downloaded the app. Got it. So, okay, cool. cool. Great. I've seen European hornets around my flies, my hives. They're, they're like, they're not the uh, murder hornets, but they're pretty big. And um, I've seen them buzzing around, you know, the this spring already. I haven't seen them yet this year. I've only seen them in okay. the spring, but I, I, yeah. So I don't know. I have no idea what your wife saw, but yeah. that's a fairly big um, insect that I've seen in the neighborhood. Okay, thank you. Sure. Have you heard about the zombie flies? They're, they're. Uh, I don't think so. Yeah. If, they, if your bees are coming to your lights at night, it's possible that you. Oh have yeah. Sorry. I. Yeah. What he was describing, um, I had read something about that, you know, like a light pollution thing. They perceive it as a threat. Um, so I started turning that light off um, to try and prevent that. Yeah, but there's actually a fly that lays its, it's, a, it's a parasitic fly and it lays an egg in the bee. And the, the, the impact, I, Jason probably knows more about this than me, but the the effect of that on the bee is they start flying uh, at night and and um, are, they're attracted to light. So. Uh, oh, I didn't understand the root cause. I've, I'd heard about bees coming to light and kind of showing defensive behavior, but I didn't know that connection. Yeah, the, I'll check that out. the way you tell if you have them is you 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 catch some of those bees that are coming at at night and put them in a jar and they'll die. And then if little worms hatch out of them. Interesting. You know that you have a problem. Yeah. yeah. Isn't nature wonderful? Um, anybody else? This is fun. 
we've really got, we've got like 23 people on, on Zoom. So that's like, and then we got like six of us here. I did have a question for Jason out in California. He said you're doing, uh, you know, a lot of work with with propolis. How's um, small hive beetles out your way? And are you noticing the use of propolis jails on the top rear sides of frames um, to trap small hive beetles? Yeah, so I I went to University of Florida. Jamie Ellis was my advisor there, and he did a lot of work with small hive beetles. So I got to learn a lot about those jails and kind of what he was seeing with those. Um, and did some kind of we had a graduate student actually come in and do some some observation hive studies, you know, where we would see the bees reaction to small hive beetles if we introduced them into the hives, uh, into the observation hives and, and watch that kind of herding behavior. They would herd them in and kind of propolize them and then keep them from leaving and feed them, you know, while they were in these little propolis jails. It was really fascinating. Um, here in California, I haven't had too much trouble with small hive beetles. I may see like three or four in a couple of the hives at Google. Um, I don't think I saw any at Stanford University. Um, none at yeah, none of most of my other sites. Um, it's just kind of a couple spots here and there, and it's not really so bad where I feel like I need to treat for them other than crush them with the, the hive tool if I do see them. Um, whereas in Florida, they were out of control. And I think it's the sandier soil um, that they can, the, they pupate into, um, and, or maybe it's the temperature, you know, since we have that, since it's cold here, maybe we're able to kill that, that cycle, um, or it, it's not as prevalent, but in Florida, uh oh, all high beetle traps in your hive. Otherwise, they'll slime it out pretty quickly. Yeah, I try to share that with new beekeepers. Pictures I've taken before of um the the the, the jails with the dead mm -hmm. small hive beetles in them, and uh, I was honored to get contacted by Dewey Karen this past year, asking permission to use some of those photos I'm always sharing with people. Oh, about, cool! Hey, don't scrape off all the propolis off your frames. The bees are using them, mm -hmm. and uh, so I'm I'm curious to see what publication he's going to use those photos in. Awesome. But, uh, not enough has talked about that because sometimes we like to scrape it all and, and use it, you know, or collect it. But yeah, don't take it all for sure. Right, right. And this is a great time to pitch uh, our next um, um, monthly meeting, uh, which will actually feature a, uh, a presentation by uh, Jamie Ellis. So uh, Jamie has uh, agreed to... Uh, to create a, a presentation about small hive beetles for us. Um, and we will um, present that video um, during our meeting. And then he's agreed to give us, to let anybody uh, uh, in the guild or at the meeting um, send him uh, questions on email. And he's uh, promised to answer all those questions. So, so I think that's a great opportunity. It's, uh, it's great to get somebody like Jamie Ellis for one of our monthly meetings. Um, and uh, he's uh, he sent he he sent me a, a sample presentation on queen uh, mating behavior, which was mind boggling. Um, but um, um, I, I don't think I could uh, I couldn't share it with everybody. Um, but uh, it was an amazing uh, it's an amazing thing. Um, but and he's a fantastic presenter. So I think it will be uh, even though it's not going to be uh, a, a person here, um, I think it'll be a real treat. Um, any questions for our, uh, our, anything else? This has been kind of fun. Norris, do you have anything to say? No? Nope. No? Listen. Okay. All right. Well, you ready to go, Jason? Yes, sir. Yep. I'm all ready. Um, share your screen. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. We may have to switch it over to slideshow mode after I share it. Yep, that's fine. We're still getting the hang of this hybrid meeting thing. That uh, looks, I see it. Okay, now it's in slideshow. You guys see that's okay still? Right. Oh, you know what? I'm gonna stop share and redo it because I think there might be a couple of things with videos in it real quick. Share screen. I don't know why it's not just the default to share audio, but. And while you're working on that, I wanna ask um, if there's any board members that are on the call and um, could you guys um, watch the chat and just um, answer questions and hand, um, you know, uh, or, or make uh, sure that we uh, answer the questions as things go along. I think 
I think I saw Carissa. Um, so if you guys could, uh, I see a thumbs up. Maybe that means yes. All right. So thank you guys. And um, Jason, it's all thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. I uh, appreciate you all. Thank you for, for having me uh, join the Guild again and, and chat with you all. Um, I'm really excited to share kind of my story and um, how I got into native bees along the way um, with hopefully sharing some insight into the bees that are local and native in your area. Um, so do feel free to, you know, shout out if you have questions. I can't see your faces anymore while I'm sharing screen. Um, I, I can, I have a chat up in the side window, but I probably won't be paying too close attention to it, but I'll try to check it from time to time. Um, but uh, try, I'm trying to keep it pretty informal. So feel free to ask questions along the way. Um, so I'm with Planet B Foundation. We work closely with with Dave, and um, we're hoping to work very closely with the Philadelphia Bee Guild um, as, as things move forward. Um, but our mission is to really share uh, our love of bees and, and nature with the world. Um, and we're a nonprofit, so a educational nonprofit. We're on a mission to change the world, one bee and one mind at a time. We feel like if kids care about bees and learn about pollination and the important services, um, that bees provide of pollination and get that kind of early spark for science that, um, you know, we'll, we'll grow a generation of people that are interested in caring for the planet a bit more. So that's what we do. Um, the way that we do this is by, uh, from corporate sponsors. So we have corporate sponsors at Google and um, several different places in the Bay Area, a uh, giant company on the East Coast is, is helping us out and so that we're able to go into schools in Pennsylvania for free. Um, our goal is to basically be able to go into schools and communities for free. Uh, the corporations are paying for it um, so that we're able to build out our program. Um, so I can talk more details about Planet B Foundation if anyone has questions about that, but I wanted to just kind of drop that in as far as who I am and where I am now. Um, now I'm going to go back in the in the Wayback Machine. Well, uh, this is where I started out, really, with bees. Um, I was a troublesome youth, um, middle school, high school. My, my hobby was trouble. Uh, and then I dropped out of high school, took about 10 years off, and I knew everything. I didn't need to be in school anymore. Um, I, so I, I got jobs in restaurants and auto body garages and, you know, all different types of different things to kind of keep me busy and and pay the bills um, until I saved up enough money and I kind of came to my senses and said, you know what, maybe school's not a bad idea. So um, I was living near Delaware at the time and I decided I'd try out University of Delaware. And I just took a couple of classes for the fun of it and stumbled across an entomology class and was like, wow, there is so much diversity. And I, I was kind of at this point in my life, I was thinking, I want to try to do something that doesn't feel like work that I enjoy doing that I'm interested in. And, you know, it doesn't bore me too quickly. So entomology, there was a million different ways to go. Um, I studied with uh, Dewey Karen. So he was one of my professors there. Um, he's written several books about bees, and he's a great mentor. Um, so he's kind of like the, I guess the, my, my grandfather of beekeeping or father of beekeeping, I guess. Anyways, uh, the first hive, this is one of the first pictures of me keeping bees there at University of Delaware. So I, uh, after I took the entomology class, I knew that was what I wanted to get into. So I made it my major. I was a research assistant for a while and Dewey said, Jason, you know, why don't you get, uh, come out to my bees and beekeeping class and try that out. And so it was kind of one of his last years teaching at University of Delaware. And so I, I came out to this class and um, he, it was basically a half lecture, half lab. And we got to, during the lab portion of it, we got to build frames, um, build hives. We got to install packages into a hive and uh, manage, basically manage a hive for a, a whole semester. And so that was super exciting and really changed my life. Um, so that's where, how I got into bees. I went on to work in Jamie Ellis's lab. So actually I was, while I was with Dewey Karen, I was working on finishing out my bachelor's degree and I was not even planning on going to graduate school. And he asked me to come into his office. We talked for a little while. He said, you know, have you thought about graduate school at all? And I, I said, no, I really need to, you know, I, I can't afford that. I need to get out and start making some money now. And he said, well, you know, I know a researcher in Florida that's thinking about starting a lab or getting started with a lab and he needs, he's going to need graduate st students and he'll probably pay your assistantship, you know, for your, your tuition and your research if you wanted to go down there. And so I went out, went down and had to talk with Jamie and 
Um, he offered me a position where I would be a researcher in his lab. Um, I still had to work on my master's and my PhD, uh, but I put a certain amount of hours into his lab and he would cover my living expenses and my tuition. So great opportunity. I went there to my master's and PhD in his lab, um, but still a bit of a rebel. Um, I wanted to work on something different than just honeybees. Even though there's a million different things I could have done with honeybees, I was super interested in just the diversity of bees. So I had to, you know, have some some difficult discussions with Jamie. He's like, well, you know, this lab is funded by beekeepers and people interested in honeybees. And I don't know if it'll work out well if you do your research. You know, my first graduate student does his research on something other than honeybees. And so I did this research project on bumblebees. And bumblebees, um, there was some papers that came out that said that if, you know, small hive beetles got into a bumblebee colony, then they could destroy it. And that... Uh, the bumblebees, you know, don't have much of a defense against them, just like honeybees. And these small hive beetles could also get into, you know, other wild bee colonies. And maybe that's a reservoir of small hive beetles. So even if beekeepers do everything they can to keep the small hive beetle out, there could still be this source out there. So I wanted to look into that closer. So I got some, and it gave me an excuse to work with a different bee. <laughs> so I got some quads and the, so these are from Copert. Uh, Copert sells these are four different or four colonies. Um, so there's four bumblebee queens. Each one has their own little box here um, and they have different entrances on a quad. So you have basically four colonies in a cardboard box um, that goes out to the blueberry farms and things like that in Florida. And it's used for they're used for greenhouse production. And so I got to study that for a while, for a while. Um, did everything from collecting the smell of bumblebee colonies and comparing it to the smell of honeybee colonies to see if there was like an odor uh, that the small hive beetles were following. Um, I did some choice tests where I, I put those smells into kind of a four-way chamber and saw which way the beetle would go um, based on whether it was honey or pollen or um, adult bees and, and try to kind of really get at how, what was the attractant here for small hive beetles to get into hives in the first place. So that kind of led me down this road towards kind of looking at native bees, even while I was also doing research with honeybees, you know, with the rest of the lab. Um, and then for my PhD, I wanted to look at just bee diversity, really. And so I set up these um, native bee nest sites uh, and I set one up. This is at the Honeybee Research and Extension Lab in, at University of Florida, the old one before they, they build a new building. Um, and so you can see I have this array here of different types of nesting situation for bees. I had um, some bins in the back that are buried that have mud and clay in them to see if the, you know I could get some mining bees in there. I had um, posts that had you know had been burned halfway to see if fire ecology played a role in, in nest selection by bees. Um, I had different types of materials I tested like cardboard, paper, plastic, different types of tubes um, inside of these PVCs that you see in the background here. Um, and when a bee nested, I would put a vial on uh, the container or the, the, the hole that they were nesting in um, and wait until they emerged and they'd emerge as adults. They'd pop out in this little vial. I would check it usually daily, but uh, at least once a week. And then if I saw a bee in there, I would let them out and you know, take a picture of it, record the species and, and then let them go. Um, so that was my PhD research. Um, it turned out to be like eight different chapters. So one on these uh, solitary bee, like the nest preference, one on the parasites that went into these nests, one on the pathogens that these bees carried, which is still kind of in prep right now to get published. Um, another on citizen science. So a lot of these, I had one set up at, I was looking at different land use too and how that affects native bees. So I set one of these up at uh, the, our research lab. I had one at a botanical garden, one at a blueberry farm, um, one at a teaching zoo, just kind of all different scenarios to see what was best for the bees. Um, you know, which types of land use, you know, showed me more diversity. And um, so some of these places, they were all, a lot of them were public places like the botanical gardens and the zoo. So uh, I'd have, while I was out there monitoring these nests, people would come by and they'd say, oh, that's cool, what are you doing? And I'd explain the research and then they'd say, I wanna do something like this in my backyard. Do you have anything for that? 
And so I started a citizen science project there at University of Florida called UF Native Buzz, where people could take a pic, you know, build a nest site, take a picture of what's, you know, what's going on and share it and um, learn a bit about bees in the process. So that was kind of my another chapter in the dissertation. Um, and then when I was uh, in the lab one day, someone called up and said, um, I know you have a bumblebee guy there. Um, and I have bumblebees in my yard. They're in an open air shed. They're nesting in clay. Um, and I need to have them removed because I have an elderly father that, you know, if he gets stung, then I'm going to have to, you know, I, I don't know if he's going to make it kind of thing. And so I went out to check it out. I was going to maybe move the high, the, the bumblebee colony for him. Um, and I was like, these look a lot like bumblebees, but they don't act the same as bumblebees. And I've never seen them nest in clay like this. So I collected a sample and took it back and, and did some research. And it turned out to be Anthrophora abrupta, which is the chimney bee. And it's a rare and rare species in Florida, just in general, as far as what all the specimen, you know, I, I went through the museum and looked at all the specimens. And I noticed that they hadn't been really seen there in about 20 uh, maybe longer, 20 years or 30 years, they hadn't been seen in Florida and they'd never been seen in Gainesville, you know, the area where I was looking. Um, so I thought maybe this was an important bee. What can I do to kind of help it out? So I put these little Tupperware bins filled with the same kind of clay that I found them nesting in. Um, I was able to source that clay from the, you know, the place where that guy had, you know, had gotten that bag originally and got like 20 more bags of it. And then I just put them all in different, you know, Tupperware containers. Some of them I had them sitting vertically, some horizontally. Uh, I let the clay kind of bake um, in the sun. And then I, when it was softish, uh, I, I put a couple starter holes in just to see if that would help in some of the nests uh, or inside of these clay bins. And sooner or later, they just started nesting in these kind of bins. Uh, the, the guy, after he found out there were solitary bees and they wouldn't sting, um, his dad, he was actually really interested in them and wanted to be part of the research. So he's one of my co-authors on the paper we got out of this one. Um, he did a, a lot of field work. He would be out there with his site, you know, um, doing clicker counts and making observations while I was doing the same thing uh, in some other places where we moved these clay bins too, to kind of seed their population in new locations that are close by, but maybe safer for the bees than just someone's backyard. Um, so we have a colony at Jamie Ellis's house. We have one at his lab. We have one at the botanical gardens and so on. So those are chimney bees. And that was really my first kind of conservation project with bees. Um, when I was trying to figure out what I was going to do next, my mom is, Jay, what are you going to do? You, you know, you're studying bees. What are you going to do with your, you know, for a career after this? And I was like, well, maybe I'll be a professor. I don't know what I'm going to do, but I'm having fun anyway. Um, and so. Uh, this is kind of a little segue. So I was looking for a job, you know, what I was going to do next. And um, so uh, University of Hawaii was looking for someone um, to do some work with a yellow-faced bee. And so I think it was this work with the chimney bee that got me working with the yellow-faced bee. So I'm throwing a lot of different bee names at you. We have bumblebees, solitary bees, native bees, and honeybees. There's lots of different kinds. Um, but just in general, you know, what makes a bee a bee and a wasp a wasp? Um, so if you look at this slide here, um, we have all different kinds of insects here, or these are all either bees or wasps. So um, if you can kind of tell what the pattern is here, some of these kind of look maybe look more bee-like, some more wasp-like. What I do with kids, uh, I, so we go to a lot of schools, what I'll do with kids is I'll go one by one. And if you think this is a bee, in chat, right B. I'm just going to show this first one in the top left-hand corner, Megakylae sculpturalis. So if you if you know it's a B, go ahead and chat and put B. If you think it's a wasp, put wasp. And so if you're at home and you're writing on chat, you can go ahead and play along if you want. And how about um, this one here, crisis, C-H-R-Y-S-I-S -S species. So this one in the very middle, you think that's a B or a wasp? Okay, so I'm gonna 
we have some people saying B, some people saying wasp. From the, so you were correct. This first one was a B, and the second one is a wasp. But maybe not everyone knows this. So um, this is kind of the cheat sheet here. If the bees are facing that way, then um, they're bees. If the bees are facing the other way, then they're actually wasps. So we have B, 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 B. Then on the second row, wasp, 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 wasp. And then the other, the bottom row, B, wasp, B, wasp, B. So um, I saw actually Sam Drogi do a, a similar thing. He's uh, he's a researcher in Beltsville, Maryland, and he does a lot with native bees. And he kind of he's done this at a lot of bee clubs. And I might be stumped on some of these, you know, um, especially, you know, the, you can, it can be very tricky to tell what the difference between a bee and wasp are. Um, the main difference is that bees have branched hairs that are kind of feather looking, whereas wasps have straight shafted hairs. Um, so you'd have to get a microscope out to be for sure. Uh, another clue is their behavior or their diet. Um, so bees all are vegetarians. They only eat pollen and nectar. Um, they actually don't harm something in order to eat it. They, they're helping what they're eating. Whereas wasps are predators, they're eating insect prey usually. Uh, could be actually arthropods, could, so it could be spiders or could be caterpillars. Um, but there, and each species of wasp usually has a, a pretty specific diet of the prey that it can eat. First bee, largest native leafcutter bee. So this first bee is actually not native, um, but it is a very large. It's a it's a resin bee. So they collect tree sap or propolis basically from trees and um, they'll use that to make their nest. Great question. Okay, so with the kids, um, we do this whole lesson about what does native mean? And we get into this deep conversation about what does it mean to be native versus non-native versus invasive? Um, so, you know, native, if I, this plant here, this cactus is adapted to its environment and uh, you take the plant out of the environment and it's usually damages the plant. Um, the environment that's ad adapted to, it's been there for many, 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 many generations. Um, and sometimes if you take the plant out of the environment, it damages the environment as well because they're so entwined, intertwined with that habitat and the ecosystem. So that's kind of our native. Native is originated in its surrounding habitat and adapted to living in that particular habit environment. So a lot of times with bees, um, the you know native bees is kind of reserved for anything that's not honeybees because we know honeybees got introduced to Virginia in the 1600s, worked their way across to by you know 1800s they're in California, but um, they weren't here in the U.S. before the early European colonists came over. Um, so. Usually, I guess a lot of people think anything that's not a honeybee must be native, but there's actually a lot of non-native bees um, in North America that may, like that one I just was talking about, that Megachylus sculpturalis. Um, not to say they're all bad or that even that the honeybee is bad, uh, but they're, you know, it could be impacting the environment in different ways. So it's important to kind of understand that and think about it. So my next job at University of Hawaii really kind of tested this for me, uh, this whole concept of native versus non-native. Um, so Hawaii, as you know, uh, was created from volcanic hot spots, you know, so the, volcan the volcanoes, underwater volcanoes created each of these islands. The oldest of the islands, you know, is going to be kind of these outlying islands and Kauai is kind of the, the biggest or oldest uh, main island, I guess. Um, Oahu, uh, a little bit younger than Kauai, Malakai, and as you go forward, Hawaii is the youngest island and it's still growing um, because of the volcanoes underwater. So uh, how can anything really be native here, right? Because these things just kind of, the island just formed up out in the middle of the ocean. Um, so basically the definition that I was explained in Hawaii is that anything that arrived to these islands without human intervention um, and before human habitation is considered a native species, whereas the very earliest humans that arrived here, the early Polynesians, are considered native Hawaiians, um, and uh, I guess from then on everything else is considered introduced. 
So the early Hawaiians or the early Polynesians also brought with them some canoe plants. So that's kind of another category of native and non-native in Hawaii. Uh, they, they brought over coconuts and different things like that, that they would need to build their shelters and have their food and, and so on. Um, but before they even arrived, there were bees there. Um, so there's yellow faced bees. Uh, this was, you know, this is my job here at University of Hawaii this is where I did my postdoc. Um, I worked with the Department of Land and Natural Resources in Hawaii and Fish and Wildlife Services um, to study these bees because they were worried there used to be these bees were everywhere. Um, you know, when the first naturalists got to the island and were documenting them, they were like, these little bees are everywhere. Um, they said ubiquitous. Uh, it was you could see them in any little habitat you went to. And there was a big diversity of them as well. But nowadays, um, I, I was, went to Maui several times, didn't see any of these yellow face bees. I spent most of my time on Oahu, uh, which is, um, I guess, going back to the, the map here. Um, so I spent most of my time here on Oahu, and I did see yellow face bees. I saw yellow face bees on Molokai. Um, so, uh, but Maui, I didn't see any. Uh, Big Island on Hawaii, I did see yellow face bees as well. Um, but we were kind of concerned because their populations were getting so small um, and less, less, you know, less collections, less likely to have them. So I did a lot of talks in schools and here's me kind of talking to a, one of the local schools about yellow face bees. Um, they're Hawaii's only native bee species. Um, so they're in the group Hylaeus. But that one bee that arrived in Hawaii somehow before humans and on its own, um, speciated into about 60, uh, close to 70 species of yellow face bees. You can tell them apart by their uh, the masks on their face. So you can see that this one has this yellow pattern on its face. It was the males that have the yellow pattern. The females' faces were totally black. Um, some species, the male and female uh, face was black. Um, but you can see that there's a big range of different facial features um, for different types of yellow face bees. So they have about 60 species, but they were really worried about seven of them in particular. And they were working on getting it listed as an endangered species, but still needed some data. And that's kind of where I came in. Um, so here was my office for about four years. Um, pretty nice view. Um, but I would go out and I would watch these bees on their, in their habitat um, and observe what was going on with them, challenges they may face. I built some native bee nest sites. So that's this block here um, to be able to observe them inside of their nests. And I worked really closely with this one species, Hylaeus anthracinus. Um, this is what it looks like inside of their nest. So I saw them nesting in these stems and I would take the stems, I would dissect them, I would rear, you know, lab rear the, I guess what the Depart Fish and Wildlife Service wanted me to do was start like a lab rearing program where I could rear, you know, bunches of these and then release them back out. Um, but that's not really the way these bees like to work. Um, so what I did, I, I studied them in the lab, um, but then I would release them back out into the wild because I didn't want them, you know, uh, I didn't want to be another cause of their demise. Um, so I studied what the inside of their nests looked like. And sometimes it would be dissections where I'd be, you know, I'd take calipers and measure the cells and measure the inside diameters of these tunnels they were nesting in. They would usually nest in stems, um, but uh, in some places they were also nesting in coral rubble. Uh, so I took some of that coral rubble. I wanted to see what was going on inside of it. Uh, really hard stuff to dissect. Uh, I, I thought maybe I would take it to... Uh, um, somewhere that had like a, a way to x-ray it or something like that. And I, I got in touch with some people at Queens um, Medical Center that were doing work with um, CT scans. And they, they offered to let me use one of their uh, machines and we put it in some of this coral. And I guess uh, it worked well for one or two pictures. And then I would put another piece of coral in and uh, started wobbling and I guess there was a, a fish hook or something stuck in it and the magnetics was you know messing with their machine so um, that that study got kind of cut short but uh, we did confirm that they're nesting in this coral um, so I studied the length of the tunnels the size the inside diameter of you know dozens of nests um, studied their mating behaviors uh, and then I built some artificial nests and so I have kind of one 
with me here. I'm not sure if my invisibility cloak, if you'll be able to see it very well. Um, but this is kind of one of those nest sites. And this was made by students at Iolani School uh, that were helping out with the project. They used a router and um, made some, some tunnels here. And so I was able to observe them. And then I had another type of nest site, uh, just a block of wood. And they nested in the block of wood fine by itself, but the wood swelled up near the, because it was on the, along the coastline. So the wood would start to swell and I would see little splintering kind of things in there. And so I'd re-drill those holes and I wasn't able to see inside. So I would just have to rely on my observations, you know, from the outside of the nest. And then I thought maybe if I put some tubes in there, so I put these little clear tubes in, then I could pull the tubes out and take a better look. So that's what I did. And was able to collect some great data on how much pollen they packed in there, how long it took the eggs to develop into adults, um, and, and saw different things. Like here, we have an ant kind of embedded in this pollen. Um, so they were going in and kind of trying to invade the nests. Um, this is kind of a above view of one of my sites, but me, most of them looked almost identical from, from above. Um, and you can kind of see uh, along the edge here, along the margin, there's kind of a different color of vegetation. And these were all the native plants that were on the coast that had not been kind of wiped out. Although uh, anybody that comes to these beaches, they're all eager to get out to the beach and they have this trail that they walk down and then they usually cut through in one way or another to their favorite spot. So this habitat is getting, you know, super fragmented. Um, so we put some fences around some of these habitat little, you know, or these little sections of habitat to try to reduce the number of cut throughs and try to let that habitat regrow. So it'll be interesting in, you know, another couple of years, maybe I'll see if someone there can get some more drone images and see how much that's helped to like defrag that uh, habitat. But that's one of their problems. Um, everything beyond that little margin is all non-native plants, kind of all the way, you know, into up into the mountains from this area. You'll, you'll see some natives here and there, but for the most part, it's all non-natives. Um, nest invaders was a huge problem. So ants, I would see ants on the flowers attacking the bees. I would see ants attacking the bees in their homes. So they're getting attacked at the grocery store. They're getting attacked at their house. Um, so it's not a really hospitable habitat for them. Um, in these artificial nest sites, I was able to control the ants by putting some tangle foot kind of around the contact point where the ants would be able to crawl in. So con tangle foot is a non-toxic substance that, uh, you know, they use in orchards to keep ants from, from tending aphids and fruit trees and things like that. I was able to use this tangle foot to keep the, the ants out of the nest sites. And we saw that that did have a positive effect on those nest sites that were treated. Um, and we saw, you know, less ants, but sometimes they could still figure out a way in. Sometimes they would cross a bridge or, uh, you know, a piece of the vegetation would be touching or the nest site would get knocked down. I can't really go around and put Tanglefoot on every piece of coral rubble in every tree in Hawaii or, you know, they'd kick me out. So um, that's a problem that they're still going to have to deal with in some way. Hylaea strenuous is another problem. So this is a bee from India that was introduced and it's a yellow faced bee, but uh, not a native to, um, to Hawaii. And we saw a lot of competition. When we saw a lot of Hylaea strenuous in an area, we would start to see a decline in the num number of uh, Hylaea anthocyanus or native yellow faced bees that we would see. Also in the rearing process, I also saw some with what looked like deformed wing virus, some that looked like they maybe have American fowl brood or you know, some type of other bee pathogen. So I was doing some pathogen screening there as well to try to figure out you know, if these bees were picking up other types of pathogens from maybe some of these introduced bees. So we usually go into what's non-native mean. So that's a species that originated somewhere else besides its current location and then got introduced. Sometimes this has a harmful effect on the environment. Um, not always, but is so the, the, the honeybee is not native to North America. Like I said, it was kind of originated in Africa and Eurasia. And, you know, since now it's on every continent. So um, it's considered non-native and on all these continents here or all these areas here. Oops. 
So invasive is a species that actually does harm um, to its new ecosystem that it's moving into. Um, so this is kind of a picture just sharing the branched hairs on the bee. So if you looked at it under, you know, with enough magnification, you could see branches on their hairs, and that's because they need those branches to carry pollen. Jason, yeah, uh, your your slides were out of sync with your your talk. So now you, we, we're seeing the invasive slide now. Okay. Let me try moving. Are you, are you seeing a bee also has now? Now we see branched hairs, complete metamorphosis, pollen and nectar diet. Okay. All right. Great. I think I'm caught up then. It might've been a lag. Okay. So yeah. So the branched hairs, this is what the, um, this is what shows us that it's a bee if they have these kind of branched hairs because that's what holds the pollen. All bees have complete metamorphosis where they go from egg to larva to pupa to adult. And all bees have this pollen and nectar diet. So um, they need to collect pollen in order for their protein uh, and they need nectar for their carbohydrates. Are you seeing another picture now, Dave, with the comb? Uh, now we're still on the same, the last one. Huh. I saw the comb picture for a second before. Okay. I, I think that's probably uh, something y'all have connection wise there where you are, Dave, because I'm seeing it just fine when it okay. updates. Yeah. I'm just going to I'm going to try to reshare and get back. Let me see. I don't know if it'll help catch up. So now but. we're seeing the, the comb and the nectar, carbohydrate, pollen, protein. Uh, all right. Great. So I think we're we're together now, but if it seems like I'm out of sync, just please let me know. I'll try to see if I can fix that. So why are bees important? Uh, really, all bees are important for pollination. That's kind of the main thing. Um, we love honey, love beeswax, but pollination is is kind of the the trait that bees all share in common. That's in, you know super important for life on Earth. Um, and pollination. So here I'm showing some pictures of flowers and kind of what happens, the act of pollination. So um, a bee will go and collect pollen and then travel to another flower. That pollen gets stuck on the stigma and it fertilizes that flower. And now that flower could become a fruit. Or uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, the, you can look at a blueberry and see where those, you know, where the parts of the blueberry that used to be petals or, you know, sepals, the different parts of the flower. So pollination is super important. About 75% of the world's crops depend on pollinators. And I got this quick video about native bees. I'm just gonna let this play for a second. Are you hearing sound? Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. try to stop it right there so this um was put together using images from the usgs bee inventory and monitoring lab uh this is by um by sam droji he uh kind of, you know led that lab and they got lots of images and they're all free to use so if you're interested in you know more cool pictures of bees that's where i got them from um this was actually put together by biological diversity so this video 
um, and uh, it's, it's helpful to kind of share with kids and get them excited about all these different species of bees. And we talk about why diversity is important really in everything, but uh, especially in, in bees. We have lots of different kinds of flowers. Um, so we need to be able to support them with lots of different kinds of bees. So there's about seven bee or seven, there are seven bee families that make up our bee species. And so this is one way to kind of study them. Um, there's the apidae, which on this wheel here, are yellow. Um, so that's our carpenter bees, cuckoo bees, honeybees, bumblebees, and so on. Uh, in green here, I have their um, caledidae family. Uh, in blue here, or later, I guess this is like teal or whatever. Uh, this lighter blue um, is helictidae's. This darker blue is megachylidae's. Um, Andrenidae are these pink and purple. Uh, and melididae is just kind of this little sliver here. Uh, and sten stenotritidae is right beside it. So these are kind of the seven B families. And you all know about apidae, especially if you already know about honeybees. If you're studying honeybees, you're studying a bee in the family of apidae. That's why beekeepers are called apiculturists or, you know, your apiary, right? It's from that apidae. So this includes the honeybees, bumblebees, carpenter bees, and squash bees. So these are all really closely related. And you know what? I'm going to go back a second. Okay. No. Yeah. So we also can look at their kind of divergence from ancestors. And so um, the, we believe that bees are, you know, their earlier ancestors were wasps um, that started collecting pollen. And there are some wasps, pollen wasps, that still collect pollen. Um, but we believe that all bees were kind of diverged from uh, ancestors that were very wasp like. So honeybees, you know, you, you, I, I don't need to preach to the choir here, but I think they're awesome. I love honeybees, think they're, they're great. Uh, very important for our agriculture. As a matter of fact, I think it's our most important insect for agriculture is the honeybee. Um, we use it for pollination of almost every crop, even though some it's, you know, they're not the ideal pollinator, they're very easy to manage. And um, well, not, not too easy, they're, they're a challenge sometimes, but uh, honeybees also have beekeepers. So everyone that goes out and takes care of a beehive will let us know if they find problems in their hive. They'll let someone know and, you know, maybe a university could do research on it and figure out what that problem is and, you know, maybe figure out ways to manage that problem. Um, unfortunately, a lot of the other native bees don't have that that uh, benefit. They don't have beekeepers that that just watch bumblebees and care for bumblebees. You know, so that's where I was concerned. What about small hive beetles if they get into bumblebee colonies? Who's watching that? Um, so here's a bumblebee. They're also in the apidae family. Bumblebees. You can tell the difference between bumblebees and carpenter bees um, because it almost looks like they have a hoodie up, like they're wearing a hoodie, because um, you can't see the back of their head very easily because this thorax is kind of uh, the hairs on the thorax are covering their the back of their head. When we look at carpenter bees in a little bit, you'll see the difference I'm talking about. Um, and then the abdomen on a bumblebee is also very furry, uh, whereas the abdomen on a carpenter bee is um, shiny. Here's the inside of a bumblebee colony. So they make these little balls of wax and inside of those, some of them have nectar, some of them have pollen, and some of them the queen has laid eggs in and they'll develop into uh, adults. I've dissected a few bumblebee, live bumblebee colonies and have can attest to the fact that they can sting multiple times. I had one uh, bumblebee get into my suit and sting me 30 or 40 times before I caught her, um, but uh, the bumblebees don't have a barb at the end of their stinger, so they can sting multiple times. You can make a nest site for a bumblebee, so um, they don't have great success. You know, people that put out 100 of these, they may have three or four of them. They get populated, but uh, it's basically not turned flower pot. Uh, uh, you bury a hose so that it has, you know, they're able to get into an entrance and think they're burrowing underground, and then they'll pop up into your um, your flower pot and make a nest in there. They typically die out at the end of the year. So you'll, if you had them start up in the spring, they're in, in the fall, they're basically self-destructing. They'll send out all their you know, virgin females and they'll mate and then they'll overwinter in some kind of decaying log or something like that that still generates some heat uh, until they're ready to emerge in the spring and find their own nest. So here's what it looks like inside a bumblebee colony. 
Um, they can be used in greenhouses, whereas honeybees can't. They'll just drive themselves. The, the honeybees just drive themselves crazy, bouncing against the glass or or wall to get out to the sun. But the bumblebees seem to be able to adapt into a a tunnel or a greenhouse, and they're pretty beautiful to watch. Um, I, a friend of mine that works at the Cal Academy of Science, he he put in a bumblebee, a live bumblebee nest for visitors to kind of go through and look at while they're in the museum. So that's bumblebees. Here's carpenter bees. So carpenter bees, they have this um, hard, shiny abdomen. Uh, and you can see the back, it's almost like they're wearing a t-shirt, whereas the bumblebees are wearing like a hooded sweatshirt, right? Um, so I could see the back of his head. I could tell it's a, a carpenter bee. Or, sorry, yeah, carpenter bee. Um, and they're, they're about the same size as bumblebees. So that's why they're easily confused. But there's a lot of diversity for carpenter bees. They're in the group Xylocopa which is, I think, wood loving, something like that. Um, but this, they're also incredible pollinators for passion flower. Uh, so in Hawaii, we had you know, quite a bit of passion flower and it's a, a, one of the favored foods. It's lilikoi or passion fruit. Um, so there was some people there interested in the pollination of passion fruit or passion flowers and carpenter bees are probably their best bet for that. Um, they just fit perfectly in there, uh, get the pollen off the anthers and, and are able to, you know, add it to the stigmas when they arrive at another flower. So uh, we have a lot of different kinds of carpenter bees. We have big carpenter bees, and then we also have these dwarf or small carpenter bees. Um, I'm going to go past this video here and show you a bit of this one. Nest cells. They'll separate out these individual nest cells with sawdust from the stuff they chewed up. In the middle here, we have a carpenter bee pupa. On the sides, we have fly pupae from a parasitic fly that has parasitized this nest. But not all carpenter bees nest in yucca stalks. You'll see a lot of carpenter bees around your deck or around your eaves, even in telephone posts. So what do these nests look like? Well, inside that nest entrance, they'll make a lot of different tunnels. Instead of just one linear series of nest cells like in a yucca stock, there are several different branching off tunnels. Usually they'll chew in perpendicular to the wood grain. This one is actually using an old screw hole to get started. Then they chew with the wood grain so it's a little bit easier for them. And they make different tunnels going off in different directions. They'll can use this for multiple years. Also, multiple females can be using the same nest entrance like you can see here. So. It's interesting because studies show that when multiple females share a nest entrance, they actually are less productive than when they nest by themselves. But regardless, each female partitions her own nest cells. She collects pollen and nectar uh, for her own offspring. You can sometimes also... So, you know much uh, about pollen, so uh, carpenter bees are solitary bees, whereas bumblebees are social. The bumblebee has a queen. She's got lots of workers, only about 200 workers compared to the thousands that are in honeybee hives. And so that's why they can't really overwinter um, because they don't have enough bees to keep it warm and you know cluster. Whereas the carpenter bee is a solitary bee and its nest is more linear. Uh, and each female provisions that nest with her own amount of pollen. And she each female lays her own eggs, which are going to develop into larvae and pupa and eventually adults. So the carpenter bee nest is very different than the bumblebee nest um, and really not something to be too worried about. Um, you know, besides damaging your structure, they don't tend to sting or defend their nest um, unless you were to catch one out of the air. A lot of times the male carpenter bees will kind of hover around and uh, anything that comes into their path, they're a bit territorial, but they're all bark and no bite. They don't have stingers, so you don't need to worry about it. You can actually catch the males out of the air and not worry about getting stung. Um, squash bees are also in the family Apidae and they're very important for pumpkins and squash. Um, I worked with these a little bit in Florida uh, where I would go out with some other researchers that were studying the squash bees. We'd have to go super Midwest early in the morning produce about 40 um, because the, the squash flowers, when they open up, uh, that's when you can see the male bees that slept in those flowers overnight. So we could count up how many male flower bees we saw in the flowers. Um, and that's a way we could kind of determine the population of squash bees in an area. Um, so the males sleep in the flowers overnight and then the, uh, the females will also come and kind of pollinate during the day. 
but our best bet was about you know six in the morning five six in the morning we go out and, and watch these flowers open count the males up uh record any observations of females we saw visiting and then they were usually closed in in florida by about uh eight nine o'clock um so that's the uh, squash peas and the family apidae there's another family calettidae and i'm not sure how how am i doing on time dave are we good for half hour uh we've got um that will take us to uh close to nine i think that's a can we um i could go quicker a little quicker than that yeah sure 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 what does the audience think or is everybody having a good time or we're I don't hear any everybody's left sorry jason May as that's well. all right <laughs> everybody's saying great good. everybody's asleep sorry y'all <laughs> i'm trying to keep it interesting but no, it's, it's great, all right cool cool i see some people saying great in chat so all right i'll just keep on going if you guys want uh just kick me off i'm <laughs> i won't take any offense to it my family tells me to stop talking about bees all the time yeah, so. your, what, did, did, did your <laughs> brother talk to you jason what's that your brother sam uh-huh he and i work together at chase you know no i had no idea wow very cool you're definitely Good. the black sheep of the family oh uh, <laughs> yeah <laughs> i try <laughs> you're doing a great job all right thanks so yeah i worked with this this is the yellow face bee i worked with is in this family coletta day they're also called masked bees or cellophane bees or polyester bees. Um, and these bees nest in the soil, usually in places where it's sandy and there could be a bit of, you know, it could be on the banks of rivers or things like that where maybe there's flooding. And so they're, what we think is that their cellophane material that they line their nest with is meant for waterproofing those nests. Um, they brush it on, they got kind of paintbrush style mouth parts. They brush on this liquid that dries into a cellophane and they put a liquid food in there and, and put an egg uh, in there to access that food. So they're pretty interesting. Um, kind of, you can see one making a nest here. They have these little portals. So they start out the nest and then they'll go back in, add the liquid diet and then work their way forward. Uh, one friend from Hawaii used to watch them, and and he said he saw them blowing bubbles. So they they don't have pollen baskets, so they carry their pollen in their mouths. They you know swallow the pollen. They have a honey kind of like a honey stomach, where they store the pollen and the nectar, and they mix it together there. And if it's too wet, then they'll go onto a flower and they'll blow bubbles to try to dry and concentrate some of that, and then they'll come back and add it to their nest. So that's the yellow or the cellophane bees, and you have them there in in Pennsylvania as well. Um, they're they're found throughout North America, but they're not the same species as what I saw in Hawaii. So next is Helictidae. So these are the sweat bees, um, and so I remembered it because uh, H A L I is kind of the um, term for haline or or salt salty. And they'll land on people while they're gardening and lick up some salt. And so that's why they were called sweat bees. So they, they need that salt as part of the, their nest making. Um, and there's a huge diversity. They're really beautiful, kind of jewel-like bees. Some of them are green, metallic, iridescent. Some of them are more you know, browns and blacks and with gold patterns. Um, but really pretty bees. Some of them are social, some of them are solitary. Uh, here's kind of another real quick video just showing some males on a plant. They tend to aggregate. Males will tend to the aggregate sweat together. The bees you see here are males that have only one purpose in life, to mate. They are one of the 4,000 native bee species in the United States and also one of the 98% that are solitary bees. Solitary bees don't have hives or communal habitat. A Okay, so I'm going to bypass the, the videos a little bit. But if you guys want to see this in, in full, you know, with some of the videos and things like that, then let me know. We do uh, a lot of these lessons for schools and things, and, you know, it can pop back on at another time. I just don't want to take everyone's, too much of everyone's time. Um, some of these are confused as wasps. They're very wasp-like looking, um, but there's, you know, dark sweat bees. Uh, next, we're moving on to Megachylidae. So this is another family of bees. 
And this is the one that you'd probably find if you had a mason bee nest in your backyard. So mason bees, leafcutter bees, wool carter bees are just some examples of megachylidae. Um, there's also resin bees that uh, use resin to make their nest. There's flower or petal cutting bees that use flower petals. Um, but their nests look pretty similar inside, except for the materials they use to build it. So they're looking for a tunnel. Um, it could be uh, in bamboo or a beetle board hole or in wood or something like that. Um, the bee will go in, put some pollen in there, or you know, make their make their nest with they line their nest with mud, put pollen in, lay an egg on it, and then put up a little wall. And each of these little walls are considered cells. Um, so inside each cell, they have their own pollen and their own egg. And they'll work their way forward and, and eventually come out as adults. Some of these actually nest in snail shells, mason bees. So you can see different types of snail shells with um, pebbles or mud you know, put in there to partition out their nests. Um, you can build observation nests to, to watch them more closely. Uh, and then this is a uh, kind of some video of them flying in to their nest. So we work closely with the group Crown Bees. Um, I've known the the founder since I was at University of Florida, and he's asked, you know, I've consulted with him for a long time about kind of what the healthiest types of nest sites to make are. Um, he uses reeds in a lot of his nests, and has some great educational material about native bees. If you're interested in checking out their website. And leafcutter bees are similar to mason bees, except they use leaves. Sometimes they'll chew the leaves up and it'll be like masticated leaves that they'll use to make their nest. Other times they'll use the whole piece of leaf. And here's a little video of a leafcutter making her nest. So these observation nests are really cool, especially for schools, because the kids can kind of watch this happening in real time. and make observations about these leaves, you know, how long it took a bee to make a, a cell or how much pollen did they bring in? How long were they away from their nest and things like that? Um, wool carter bees is uh, another type of megachylidae and the, you have those in, in Philadelphia. Um, these are European bees as well. So they may get along real well with the honeybees. They, gather the fibers off of flat off of plants like lamb's ear and they'll use that like a cotton and line make their nest with that so if you had a native bee nest site and you're looking to see if it had any activity and you see a little bit of cotton at the end of it then you have a wool carter bee nesting inside um, andrenidae so these are minor bees they they mine into the soil um, some of the Melitidae's use some of the flower oils uh, to attract mates. And Stenotritidae, uh, they're only really found in Australia, so we're not going to talk about them unless I am doing a presentation in Australia. Some people make native bee houses from everyday objects they find at home. Here is a picture of a native bee house that someone made. So there's a if lot of different instructions one's... online about how to make native bee nest sites. And we're happy to share what information we've gathered for you know how to make native bee nest sites. Um, I'm interested in kind of having an army of citizen scientists out there setting up native bee nest sites and providing data so that we can have a better idea of what's going on with the native bees in your area. Kind of like recruiting beekeepers um, to, to watch these solitary bees. And uh, so we started this citizen science project with Planet B Foundation, where anyone can, it's basically a, a spinoff of what I did at University of Florida. And then um, I also had done something in uh, while I was at University of Hawaii with a Bishop Museum, where we started this pollinators in paradise campaign where people could, you know, go out and monitor for native bees on the beach. Um, but this one's for, it's, it's, we could do this nationwide. Uh, we're offering this to schools, we're offering it to corporations, to non other nonprofits and community groups um, to be able to take a picture of their native bee nest site and have a place to record data that they find about it as far as what nesting materials seem to be working, what challenges they're having, and so, sort of provide a forum for solitary beekeepers. So there's lots of different designs out there. Some of them 
good, some of them bad, some of them great, some of them not so great. Um, and there's lots of reasons why some of them do not work. Um, so there's some debate uh, between other bee researchers as far as how big these should be and how many you know nest sites should be aggregated in one area. Um, and you know, just like with honeybees, if we have an apiary that's you know that has a hundred hives at it, we're probably going to end up having more small hive beetles there than we would at a apiary that only has two or three hives. Um, so the more bees that you have aggregating in one area, the more likely it is that you'll have more pests and parasites and predators or and uh, pathogens really um, because of that buildup of bees. Um, but if you have an area, I guess if you have a nest site that has a diversity of holes, then we actually see the opposite be the case. We see less parasites and less um, pathogens and predators because each of these, so if we have very small tunnels next to very big tunnels, we're going to get two different species of bees in those different tunnels. Um, and so that diversity is what kind of creates the health of the ecosystem. Um, so those are just some recommendations, but really, you can engineer a native bee nest and try it out yourself and see what you find. Um, what kind of data we'd be collecting is uh, you'd be monitoring and looking at your straws at the end of your bamboo or, or tunnels that you drilled in wood and looking for the, the end caps. So when we see this end cap of leaf, then we know that we have a leaf cutter bee in there. So that could only really be megachile and we can maybe even find the species depending on where you are. Um, if it's mud, then it's a mason bee. Uh, if it's resin, then it's a, one of the resin bees and so on. So we would just be looking for pictures of your nest site over time, uh, whenever you get cappings and, and you can kind of contribute data as far as how many of those successfully emerged. Uh, you could also have an observation hive where you could look inside of it and, and get even more data as far as how much bee bread that they have stored or how long it takes the larva to develop. And we're asking that you share what you find. Um, so when we do this with schools, we want them to put together a presentation for us to share how their nest site did. Um, we'd like them to use it like an experimental science challenge where they put one up high and one down low or one facing north and one facing south and or one using just bamboo and one using just cardboard tubes and kind of see what the best is for their area. Um, this is that tool I was saying. Uh, so I wanted to share with you all um, this is another part of the citizen science. Um, it's called our pollinator safari, where you can go out and use this app. It's iNaturalist. You can take a picture of any living thing and it'll try to identify it for you using AI. And then it will geotag and date, you know, that observation and can be used for, you know, it's open access. So other researchers can go on and see what kind of bees are in your area. Um, this could be really helpful. Uh, for us, and it's also kind of fun to do. It's almost like, you know, using that Pokemon Go game so you can collect them all, um, but you don't actually have to collect the bees, just take pictures of them. So we have a QR code here. If you're interested, if the spirit moves you, feel free to scan that. Um, you could join up our citizen science project and I could share more details with Dave so you guys can all have access. Um, this is just some some of how we use this. So when I go into classrooms in Philadelphia, um, I'll you know ex I'll do a little talk like this, and then I'll say, "So what bees do you have in your area?" And you can actually go here and you type in bees, and then you put in Philadelphia, PA, and this is under the Explore button, and then it'll show you all the bees that have been found in you know in Philadelphia. Um, so there's three thousand six hundred and thirty-two observations in Philadelphia. I'm going to remember this. And if I check tomorrow and it's gone up to 3,633, maybe one of you took a picture of a bee on a flower. That'd be pretty cool. And then if it happens to be a bee that we haven't identified in Philadelphia, then it'll go from 81 species to 82 species. Um, each of these species is one of these little points on the map, or each, sorry, each observation is one of these points on the map. So we have a couple here of the, the honeybee, Apis mellifera, um, if I go on to the next page, this shows uh, in grid form. So I can click a button and it'll go to grid form and I could look at just the species. And it organizes it from the most observed to the least observed. So our most observed species of bee in Philadelphia is the common Eastern bumblebee, Bombus impatiens. That's also the one that's commercially available through Copert. So if you wanted to increase their populations, you get some of those and set them up in your area. 
Uh, Eastern carpenter bees is the second biggest observation, that Xylocopa virginica. Um, and then honeybees is the third. And you can see this IN up here just means it's introduced. Um, some of these, they may say threatened or endangered, um, if it were an endangered bee. And of which there's only kind of one bumblebee and the yellow face bees I was talking about before. Um, so you can kind of see here, this is the some of the diversity of these 81 species. And I took screenshots of all of them so you could take a quick look. Uh, we have the European wool carter bee and the uh, large resin bee, which are the introduced species here, and the rest are considered natives. Um, so kind of going through this, you can see there's some good diversity. You all have Hylaeus in Philadelphia area. So if you set out something with a very small entrance hole, um, about the size, think the size of a cart of a coffee stirrer, you may get some of these bees nesting in that. You have uh, flat-tailed leafcutter bees, so you may get those using your nest sites. You may have this oblong, so this is a more native wool, uh, wool cart, or no, this one's introduced to. Uh, another mining bee here, it's introduced. We have alfalfa leafcutter bees, which were introduced for pollination of alfalfa. Um, and let's go through here, the Texas leafcutter bee and so on. And I'll just kind of scroll through this pretty quick. I'm almost to the very end of my presentation here. The, the patchwork leafcutter bee, um, but there's a lot of diversity there. This is only in Philadelphia. These are all bees that have been observed in the Philadelphia limits. There's this really cool one, the silver-tailed petal color cutter. So they use flower petals instead of leaves. So the inside of their nests are really pretty looking. Um, and you can click on any of these observations and it'll take you right to kind of this summary page, which shows you how those observations played out in real time. So they saw more observations kind of in April, May, June, July is kind of seems to be the peak of their population. And then they're died out by October. You know, you don't see them anymore until the, the next spring. Um, so John Asher up here is one of the top identifiers. He's with the American Museum of Natural History. Um, and he's a bee expert. He's the taxonomist I would send specimens to to see if I was correct with my identification. Um, but he's on here just as a hobby. He goes on and identifies people's bees for them. So um, you'll get usually an observation within about a week, you know, depending on how good your picture was. Uh, sometimes they, they can't identify it because it's too blurry and they can't tell what the characteristics are. Um, sometimes they could only get it to maybe the family level because sometimes you need to pull a mandible out of the bee to be able to say for sure what species it is. Um, but they get very close with a lot of these identifications just from pictures. Um, so that's iNaturalist. Um, and let me just see here. So we use this a lot of times for, you know, showing kids what the bees at their school are, and then talking about how each of these bees, you know, how you could help those bees with more host plants or um, nesting resources. And that's my spiel. You can visit us at planetb.org. I'm Jason at planetb.org. If you want to send me an email, if you got any questions, and I'm going to stop share now. And see if we have any questions or comments. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, <laughs> little little love. That, that was fantastic, Jason. That was wonderful. Thanks so much. I, I think I hope you don't mind some questions. Uh, anybody have any uh, questions? I, I have Jason? a question. Wait, we've got one in the room here. Great. How is bamboo for nesting for these native bees? How is bamboo? Yes. Uh, that was the most popular nesting material that I used in Florida. Um, in Florida, I used bamboo, paper, cardboard, and plastic, and also holes drilled into wood. And mm -hmm. bamboo was preferred, uh, see, you know, the bees seem to prefer that the most as far as my stems um, go. So the straws, different types of materials I use for straws. Um, it was very resilient. Um, it was difficult to uh, to dissect. So at the end of the, of the year, when I had my bees nest in those, at the very end of the year, sometimes I would try to open up those to see the ones that didn't make it, how, how it was inside. And so I'd have to use some, uh, some plant clippers and, and kind of cut one end and then cut the other side and then kind of just break it apart and open it up. Um, bamboo is more difficult than reeds. Reeds is are, are what they're using at crown bees. Um, and so they prefer to 
harvest their cocoons. I didn't really do much cocoon harvesting, but uh, it it seems that the the bamboo is not not best for that if you're trying to harvest out those cocoons and save them somewhere till the spring. But if you're just going to let them nest on their own, I would say bamboo is a great choice. What diameters do you choose? So for uh, I, I would recommend going from three thirty <clears throat> seconds of it. Uh, so for your drill bits, there's a, there's a drill bit that's 330 seconds. It's very small, about the size of a coffee stirrer, um, the hole in a coffee stirrer. So that's the smallest I would use. The largest I would use would probably be about five six of an inch. Um, and that's the, that's the size that carpenter bees would use. I don't see any reason to go any bigger than that, really. Um, you know, unless I was going for kind of the, the, the largest bee, uh, which I... Um, they're, they're not found here, but the wild Wallace is giant mega Kylie B, but yeah, we don't have those here. So I think five, six of it, five, six of an inch, um, is your largest and three thirty seconds of an inch would be your smallest for inside diameter. But I'd recommend a whole range. If you just have, want to get one drill bit and do it all, then I would say like three sixteenths is a good kind of middle ground. You'll get a lot of leaf cutter bees and Mason bees and things like that all using about three sixteenths of an inch. You need to drill it, or can you just cut it at the end? No, you could just so uh, you could just cut it at the end. So for bamboo and um, and things like that, you just cut it at the end. I was measuring it by taking the drill bits and then putting it inside the the um, inside of the bamboo just to kind of gauge. Okay, this is about a three eighths inch piece of bamboo. This is a three sixteenths inch piece of bamboo. So that's kind of how I was measuring the inside diameters. Um, when I wasn't using caliper, calipers to do that. Um, so that was kind of just my guide. And a lot of times I would I would do the holes in wood. So that's why I kind of refer to the, the drill bits because you know I could use any size really on wood. I could use the smallest drill bit up to the largest drill bit. Great. Thank you. That help? Yeah. On the hey, Jason, if we want to leave things in our yard for these bees to use or whatever other insects right when are they done using them or you know like i don't want to clean my yard up but then i don't uh -huh. know when <laughs> great question yeah and so one other thing about that so if you have like stumps and snags and things like that in your yard that have some holes in them from woodpeckers and stuff like that that's probably great native bee habitat yeah. um and if you if you're able to leave it then i think that's a great idea um, other things that are helpful in the yard would be anything with a pithy or um, hollow center, it's like plants, like a like blackberry, you know, has this pithy, pithy center in the stem, and bees can kind of clean that out and use that bramble uh, to nest in. So, other plants, you know, if you're clipping and you're like, oh, this has a hollow center, well, yeah, leave it because it may be good for bees to nest in as well. Um, and that's a really tricky question about the timing because. I was trying to do the same thing at University of Florida. Um, I'd have these bees nesting and I'd be like, when is it over? And they would just keep on, you know, more would emerge out and then new ones would nest inside of them. Um, so the way that I did it was once a year, I would go through and I would clean out my nest sites um, and anything that had bees in those nests, you know, like say I had a bunch of bamboo and it was all nested in, I would take that nested in bamboo and put it into like a Tupperware container that was dark. Um, and I put a little hole in that Tupperware container. And as the bees come out, they're just gonna look for light. They'll go up and fly out that little hole and, and get out and then back out to the world. Um, so that's kind of how I, I released those from my nest site. Um, they're they're kind of tricky because sometimes they call it bet hedging with the bees. Um, so sometimes you'll see two nests right next to each other, side by side, probably made by the same female. Um, one, it takes the bees two or three weeks and then they're emerging out as adults and the other i'm you know i watch it all year long and it doesn't emerge and i think it's dead and then the following year they emerge out so they call it bet hedging um in you know the native bee research it's a, a way that the bees can kind of time out you know and have some bees emerge out same season and some bees not emerge out into the following season i'm not really sure all the magic behind the curtain but that's kind of the idea so you know i guess the uh, native bees some of some species will nest and emerge quickly others it takes them a very long time you know sometimes over a year for them to go from egg to to pupa to adult 
So sorry if that non-answer helps, <laughs> but that's kind of the idea, yeah. I had a lot of them um, for mason bees. I have a lot of buried holes and I have a bunch of tra traps in my yard and there was mason bees that were in straw, paper straws and in bamboo this year that really got parasitized. Mm. I'm wondering what's a technique that I could use, maybe harvest them sooner. Um, I'm, I'm just curious if you have any ideas. Yeah, so I would recommend checking out crown bees. Um, they they uh, have have some videos about how to harvest and when to harvest and how to keep different parasites down, especially with mason bees. The founder was the um, was on the board of the I think it's the blueberry the the orchard mason bee society or uh, anyways they have developed a lot of different tools to kind of look at that. Um, Sometimes if you use a nest site that all the, that have all the same holes, so I'm holding up an example here. So this has all the same holes, so you would get all the same species of bee. So, you know, in your case, if it was mason bees, you'd have a higher concentration of mason bees there in your yard than what's probably out in nature. Um, so that could be, you know, one possibility. Uh, so I would put, recommend maybe put it, you know, adding in some larger size holes or some smaller size holes and increasing the diversity. And that might be one thing that helps. Um, another thing is the, the wall size. So paper is really easy for parasites to get through. Cardboard is a bit harder. Um, reeds and bamboo, probably harder still. So, you know, having a, a solid wall that the parasites have to get through. Another thing that um, I have, have been experimenting with myself a bit is taking a piece of felt, you know, like the fabric, uh, any color, just felt, and then putting it at the bottom um, here seems to stop a lot of mites and parasites. So just kind of at the base, at the entrance, or even along the whole inside, I could line that with felt. Uh, and, you know, I saw, you know, some invaders getting trapped in the felt where they're um, their legs get trapped in it and they're not, or they don't like to walk across it for some reason. And, and so I was seeing less of those as well. Like a Swiffer pad. It kind of like that, yeah. Are there any, uh, Carissa, are, are there any uh, questions in the chat that we should be uh, asking, Jason? Jason, I have a question for you. Um, sure. These, these, have you heard of Doug Sponsor's research he did a couple years back with his citizen science? He provided PVC tubes um for for participants around philly and you know we're in northern chester county but he was interested in those kind of studies as well and we sent him pictures with the orientation of the tubes and he provided the cuttings and we sent him pictures of the front and back um once a month for majority of the year were you aware or no i was not aware of that research? No, but I'd love to dig into it. Um, could you could you mention the name again? I'm just going to write it down. Doug Sponsler. He he's from Philly. He did some research out Midwest. Now he's in Germany. But um, S P O N S L O R or is it E R? E R. E R. Yeah. So okay. he did he did a neat citizen science project um, back what was that three four years ago? That might be of interest to you. Very cool. Seven, yeah, I'll seven, definitely seven, take into that. Yeah. But the, the, the one main point I wanted just to point out is um, when we talk about native bees with people and what people can do to help, um, there was a, a really good podcast on Beekeeper Confidential talking with a native bee specialist. And she said a lot of these houses are, are well intended, but ill designed because they're not deep enough. They're not over six inches and the, the male female mm -hmm. ratios are usually off. Uh, some, you know, a lot of bees need that depth but right. that even after one season definitely after two they become almost death traps if you're not cleaning them out due to pests and pathogens and it all comes back to humans trying to be the answer and solution when we just need to um be the stewards and let nature be the answer because what these bees have evolved with for thousands of years are the native plants um trees stems snags that they need for their habitat so a lot of these you know save the bees action you know going out and buying a native bee house making these tubes it's interesting for observations for us to see but would you not agree that what we need to let 
happen is to help create habitat and let nature be the solution and kind of get man out of out of the way um so yeah that's a kind of a philosophical question that you know I, it comes to me very often at, at talks um i also get into the whole you know honeybee versus native bee thing seems like you know a, i guess a lot of when i went to university of florida and i was in jamie's lab you know he was like well this is funded by beekeepers and we have to keep it honeybees and you know they're they're the ones that are important for pollination because we're we're managing them and we're caring for them and you know they're like livestock basically right um and so uh native bee people a lot of times will say jason why are you doing anything with honeybees because you know it's really the native bees that we need to care for the honeybees are you know like chickens and uh, who cares about them and so kind of you know on that on that note, I'm, I think they're all important. You know, I think the chickens are, you know, just because chickens are livestock doesn't mean we don't need them. And they're, you know, not important animals for, you know, here on planet earth, right. Just because they're, they're not wild. So same thing with honeybees, just because, you know, we, they're kind of like livestock, you know, we actually depend on them for almost all of our commercially available fruits um, and, and vegetables. Um, so that debate uh, is very similar to this one, um, but with the bee kind of native bee purists, a lot of them are, you know, humans just need to get out of the way, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, I don't think that people are just going to say, okay, I'm, you know, yeah, you're right, native bees, let's just leave them and, and let them do their own thing. Um, while it would be great if we all just, you know, were able to do that, I think we don't know enough about them. Um, and by learn, you know, by setting up native bee nest sites and things, we can learn more to be able to maybe make a prescription for that habitat and say, okay, this habitat needs, you know, this type of nest site or this type of nesting material, or it needs these host plants. Um, and so I think we're a little bit, I guess, too far down the road to, unfortunately, same thing with big ag, you know, if we have monocultures where there's miles and miles of nothing but blueberries like how beneficial is that for our native environment um you know after those blueberries to set fruit i saw clusters and clusters of honeybees just hanging on to like the last you know flower or two to try to get some food before they were moved on to some other field um so uh yes i, I guess that that's a great question i'd love to chat with you more about that um yeah it wasn't and, so much yeah. about people not doing anything right but but the real solution being, you know, native pollinators need native habitat. And that sure. should be the message because I think people more so try to help by buying these houses, but that's not habitat forage and ecosystem. Like you brought up chicken. Chickens are important for people, yes, because we eat them and, and things like that. But chickens are not important for the ecosystem. Whereas, this, yeah. yeah, the same discussion can be had. Um, with honeybees in the ecosystem, they're good for people. People, yeah, we, we use them to pollinate crops and their products are very healthy for people. But mm -hmm. when it comes to the ecosystem, you know, beekeeping is agriculture with livestock. It's not conservation. Conservation is creating habitat. Right. Um, yeah. The yeah, one so thing I, I wanted mean... to say about the native plant stems is that um, more current research is showing that the, the native bees use stems that are two seasons old. So I, I love the idea that fellow who doesn't want to clean up his yard. That's great. Leave the leaves. You know, a lot of pollinators are under those leaves. Mm -hmm. um, but it's it's the the more current research is that uh, the stems are two years old that are best used for the native bee habitats. And um, you said your 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 bumblebee terracotta plant habitat. There's this neat beekeeper, um, Bruce, out in the Berks County way who told me that bumblebees seek out abandoned rodent nests. So anytime right. he finds a mouse nest anywhere, he uses that material, puts it in something outside, like a birdhouse on the ground and uh, a hollowed out gourd. And that, um, that actually that rodent smell and nesting material seems to really attract bumblebees in case uh, you yeah. probably knew that. Um, yeah, but that's true. Other I, people. I, a good point, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up. That's yeah, and I guess they also use the fur as kind of a insulation um, since they don't have the thermoregulation down like honeybees do. Okay. Yeah, I had one question. Um, sure. Don't feel obligated to answer it. But <laughs> the yellow faced bees, you said when they had different masks, they're each a different species. Right. 
how is that a different species as opposed to like, I mean, if one person has a pointier nose than another? I mean, right. What, 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 why does the mass determine its species? Is there any other biological difference or physiological difference? Yeah, there are physiological and biological differences. They did DNA analysis on them um, and, you know, we're able to see that there are different species in that way, kind of genetically. Um, and also they can't interbreed. So that's kind of our definition of a, of a, um, you know, of a species is they can't, you know, um, they can't meet with a, with a non-specific species, you know, like a different species um, because they're either separated, you know, geographically or because physiologically they just can't meet. Okay. And so, yeah, so that's, that's the way it is with the yellow face bees. Those are kind of all moved different ecosystems in Hawaii. Um, they don't now, you know, have that crossover. They're not able to mate with each other. And so each one is considered a different species. Well, it looks like we're about at the end of the uh, presentation. Jason, this was um, fantastic. Um, I really appreciate uh, your time and um, your presentation. Let's um, talk um, after this and I'll, we'll try to get some links to some of that other material that you, uh, uh, that you were showing uh, up on the website. Um, we are in the middle of uh, rebuilding our website, so it might take a, a week or two, but um, let's, let's collaborate on that. Oh, we definitely will do. And, and, and you all are in for a treat with Jamie's talk uh, next month. Um, Jamie Ellis is a great speaker. Um, you know, I'm super grateful that for the time I got to spend in his lab and excited for y'all to, I'm glad that he's following me up and I'm not having to go on after him because y'all would be disappointed if I had to talk after him because he's, he's great. Thank you guys. Uh, I don't think that's true. I think you did a wonderful <laughs> job and it'll be difficult for anybody to top it. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks everybody for, uh, let me get this so I can keep the camera. Thanks everybody for coming and um, for uh, uh, participating. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed this. Um, Jason is uh, easy to reach and, and uh, always willing to uh, answer questions. So if you have anything uh, else for him, um, you can either send it to us at info at phillybeekeepers.org or you can send it to Jason at jason at planetbee.org org right yeah and, and um get your questions answered and and maybe we should change our name to the philadelphia bee guild instead of beekeepers right <laughs> anyway thank you jason thank you everybody um good night good luck and we'll see you all next month thank you y'all have a great time bye thank you bye-bye